All right, welcome back. So throughout the first little over half of the semester, you learned most of those technicals of the camera. So exposure, shutter speed, aperture, all of those things that go into how to manipulate the camera into crafting an image, an image of your choosing, an image that you have um, your own artistic intention and style behind. Now we're going to talk about the other part of a photographer and what really sets photographers apart from just amateur image makers, right? And the first part is technicals. You've got that, you understand all of those. The second part is this idea of seeing as a photographer. And if you were able to go to the guest lecture, he also talked about this idea of seeing as a photographer. What does that mean? That is the ability to see any sort of environment, any sort of scene, and be able to compose that within the picture plane. So when we are taking photographs with our camera, we are taking the 3D world and we're condensing that onto a 2D rectangular picture plane. In order to do that, you need to be thinking about, okay, what am I including in the image? What am I excluding? How am I cropping this? Uh, how are these elements going to be kind of condensed onto this 2D format in a way that is aesthetic and pleasing and nice and intriguing? How does it connect to your viewer? So today we are going to talk about the compositional elements that you can think about. When you first learn these, they're going to be vocabulary terms, but as you start to get very proficient with your photography, you will start to just automatically see the world with these concepts. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into it here. All right, so this is also AKA how to read a photograph. So a photograph can be read just like a book or an article or an essay, it has a story to tell. And when we learn these compositional design elements, we can actually distill them down into their component parts and we can be able to kind of digest them and also be able to articulate them to others. So these are all elements of design. Elements and principles of design is a term that was coined by uh, Joseph Albers in the Bauhaus movement. Um, so he was an artist and also a teacher. The Bauhaus movement might be a term that you have heard and they were really kind of forward thinking and very progressive in the way that they taught. So he formulated this set of rules, right? And each 2D artwork has to fall into this set of rules. We can kind of distill it down into these singular points and then describe them based on how they fit within these points. And it's called the elements and principles of design. Okay, so let's talk about them as they fall into photography itself. So number one, we have this idea of a point. What is a point? It is a singular element within a larger space. So anytime we see a singular element within this expanse of either background or negative space, we can describe that as a point. If you are very into math, you might understand point as being one point of data, right? One number in a larger spectrum line, numerical order, etc. So when we're talking about photography, we don't always mean literally a point. Typically when we photograph something, something creates the point. So in this image here, it's an image of the ocean with two figures. And these two figures create a sense of a point. And this figure right there that looks like the back of a child's head that there is kind of our singular point. And we have this expanse of negative space or background so we can really focus on these two figures as they're creating a large point, but really this singular black dot that is creating our focal point, our singular point of interest. Okay, and here again, I would, I would consider these as 
points. So we are thinking about all of these shapes as they exist on this picture plane as a sense of kind of multiple points coming together to create a texture. Okay, next up we have a line. So if we're also thinking in mathematical terms, a point is a singular piece of data. A line is a series of that data all next to each other to create a linear element or a line. So we're thinking, we're thinking one singular plane. Now we're thinking in the 2D plane. What is this line? Okay, so this is a Harry Callahan image. I think I've shown perhaps a few other Harry Callahan images here. Um, if you know what this is, if you can think abstractly, this is actually a figure's backside, right? But it is very artistically shot in that all of this is a negative expanse of imagery and the entire content we are creating with just that line. So when we distill down that line, we can then kind of carry that further. What does this line remind you of? It's sort of vegetal. It looks like sort of a sprig of some sort of growth. Um, if you know what this image is, uh, he took a lot of images of his wife, Eleanor. So I do believe she is the model here, but I can't be certain exactly for this image, most likely. Okay, so that's one large line or a series of lines creating the entire image for us here. And this one much more complex. This is a lot of lines all coming together. And when you create all of this massive lines, we get something else, which is this textural element. We'll talk more about that a little later, but I think it's relevant to say here, all of these reeds in the lake are creating all of these sort of line elements. When you get multiples of those together in one space, it starts to do more for us. Okay, so now because we have so many lines all together, it's no longer minimal. Instead, we start to get overwhelmed and it creates this sense of texture, multitude, even chaos. Okay, and now here's something in between. So this is a different exposure, but also of vegetal or grass elements, kind of creating what I would say is a calligraphic line. What is a calligraphic line? It comes from the, the word calligraphy. So if you think about script that someone is writing and all of those swooping lines, that is essentially what a calligraphic line is. It's a line that has a lot of movement. It can change width and dimension. Um, it kind of guides your eye towards somewhere. It's often very whimsical and elegant. So these grass elements are creating all sorts of these kind of soft calligraphic lines that create the sense of visual movement for us. But again, it's all throughout the picture plane. Um, there's not one singular point of interest. It's sort of all across that picture plane, creating this sense of uh, overall tone. Okay, and here's a different take. So I'd say this combines both point and line. So we have points of singular data, but they're connected with these little points of line, and they're not connected to each other. They are elemental, sparse, and sprigs all throughout our picture plane. So it creates a really unified texture. That's another vocab term, this unified picture plane. Um, really even sense of rhythm and tone in this one. There's a very direct line. Uh, so this actually has some perspective here. So we have this sense of a receding line is what this is called. Uh, we know from real life that this is a line down the middle of a road, that center line that's painted on the pavement. And we know just through our visual perception that these lines tend to start large and appear to get smaller and smaller and smaller as they get to that horizon line. The actual line width stays the same throughout, but because of our perspective or our vantage point, it does appear to get smaller and that is what a receding line does. So that again creates this really strong sense of movement. It guides our eye. We start down here 
when we look at this image and our eye just seamlessly kind of glides towards the top of the image. So it's also a sense of eye movement that's important to think about when you're viewing any sort of image at all. What do you look at first? That's typically going to be your focal point and where does your eye then take you? That's then the movement of the piece. All right, point and line, what's next? Plane. So again, if we're thinking about this in terms of math or space, we have one single point, we have a line that continues, it's a series of points or a series of data, and now we're thinking about plane. So we have that point, we have that line, and then the plane is as if you know, we took that pane of window, I, I gave that same metaphor when we were talking about aperture, when we were talking about the depth of field. Depth of field can also be seen as a plane, right? So it's all across your image, it's all across the scene, but it's as if there was a pane of glass. And that is what we are talking about. We're talking about one plane of elements or images. So it's as if it's a wall, a, a pane of glass, uh, a piece of paper. All of those are examples of planes. So case in point, a wall, right? So we have one singular plane, meaning there's not a lot of depth here, but we do have this really even rhythm this unification of elements. Everything in this image is impressive because it is so constant, it is so regular. All of these lines of our perspective are really remarkably even, everything is very regular. Instead of a photograph, this almost looks like a textile or a graphic of some kind. Um, so this photographer had to take very painstaking measures to get everything lined up exactly the way that it is. All right, and so this has a few examples of planes. So if you think of plane as a piece of paper, one, one element that we can kind of drop into this scene, we have a couple. We have one, this back wall with all these windows here. This other plane that we have is here. So we have two planes seemingly meeting. And then we have a really direct, our focal point are these bright plane, planes of light created by that light coming into this train station here. And these, this sense of plane where all of that natural light is streaming in, that is our focal point. Why is that our focal point? Because that's the brightest. So it's the outlier, it's very bright, it's very white versus all the rest of the image which appears very dark. It's where our eye goes to first. So that is the focal point being created by this plane, but arguably there are at least three planes in this image. All right, we talked about point, line, plane, what's up next, volume. So again, if we're thinking about this in terms of space, we have a point, we have a line, which is a series of points, we have a plane, which is that 2D surface. Now we're thinking about volume, which is that 3D surface, that sense of mass, which obviously we don't have in a photograph. A photograph is taking that 3D space and cond condensing it into a 2D world, but we can create the illusion of volume within our photographs. And that is a choice. We can choose to either exemplify that or we can choose to really abstract that. Okay, so this is a nice example of plane, I'm sorry, of volume, because we, through the shadow, get the idea that these, which are legs, have a sense of mass. Right, because they are casting those shadows in that way, we know that they are made of substance. They are creating mass. They have a, a weight and a roundness to them. So anything that is a shape, either a round, oblong, pyramid, a, a box, all of those are shapes that have mass, right? So the idea that the shadow is cast around these conical shapes, these cylindrical legs, that gives us a sense that they have mass. 
All right, next up, whoop, sorry, too fast, shape. So a little bit different than volume, shape can be distilled. It can be kind of, it can be lacking volume or mass, or it can have mass and volume. But shape is helpful when describing an image, and often we talk about uh, positive and negative shape. So this is a great example. Again, this is a Harry Callahan. So this figure is shot in such a way that we get black and white. We get positive and negative shape. So our positive shape is going to be the one that appears to be our subject. Our negative space typically is the surrounding element. So it's our blank page, it's our blank canvas. That's our negative space. Our positive space or positive shape is the subject here, this silhouette. And we can think about this in terms of, this is just the shape of this figure. That's all we know. We don't know about anything else in this photograph. We just can see this black shape. And through that one piece of information, that single shape, that black shape, we can deduce. Our brains are very smart. They jump to conclusions very quickly for us. Uh, we know this is, this is a figure. This is a human. The human is kind of positioned in some sort of way. We know a little bit about this figure. Um, I think it's a female figure. We know roughly the size and shape of this figure. Um, we know about the hair, about the hands. We don't know anything about the cultural background, the, the face, anything like that. But we can deduce quite a lot just from that simple outline shape. Okay, this is an Edward Weston. Don't recall, I do believe I've talked about Edward Weston before in this class, uh, but this is the famous Pepper series. So this is great for describing this sense of not only shape, but also volume. So in this one here, it was shape that was abstracted. We're only looking at shape. In this one here, we're looking at shape and volume. So the shape is very clear because it's set on this pretty neutral background. So we get a really distinct and unique organic shape here. But we also get the sense of volume as created by the light and shadow. So that's what Edward Weston was really famous for was creating these light installations that were really soft and really expressive on his subject. So there were bright whites and there were deep dark shadows and there was everything in between. So you really got the sense that these items were in the round. You really got a sense of the shape and volume of them. And this was created through a very meticulous studio set. So that is always an option for you. You don't always have to do street photography. You don't always have to do candid photography. Um, in fact, a really fun way to photograph is through meticulous sets, studio settings. All right, what's up next? Value. So when we talk about value, it doesn't mean the price. Um, this is separate from the valuing that we talked about in Critique, how to value the artwork. This is a specific word and when we're talking about the elements and principles of design that describes the lights and darks. So when we're looking at an image, we can say it has a lot of value or it does not have a lot of value. What that means is black and white and all of the grays in between. So in this image, I would say this does not have a lot of value because there's mostly white and black. There are not a lot of what we call mid-tone grays in this. So this is a rather stark image. We have bright white and we have deep black, so it does have that range of value, but it doesn't have all of the grays in between. So it's very stark in contrast. We can also talk about this in terms of contrast. It has stark contrast, but it doesn't have a great value range because it doesn't have all of those mid-tone grays. But it does have what we always look for in a photo, which is a bright white and a deep dark black shadow. You always want to have those two at least somewhere in your photo to make a great photo. Otherwise, it will appear very washed out. Okay, and here now is the opposite, but 
we have some more stuff going on. So we do have these deep, rich blacks. The Most of the photo is made up of these deep blacks. That would be our negative space is created by the blacks. But we do have these bright whites here. And then we do have, if you look within the details, we do have a range of values in the figure space, in the details of the car. And this image is composed really uniquely. We get two thirds of the image that are kind of this negative space, this car hood that appears to be coming towards us. Most of the interest in the photo is in that upper third and is kind of confined by this rim of the car window here that is our brightest element. And then our focal point really is that face. That is what is kind of guiding my eye. That's what really captures me. That's what I continue to go back to so that there is the focal point or the most important point where our eye goes to very quickly. All right, next up, let's talk about texture. I couldn't help myself. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but texture is that sense whoop, that we have all of these elements coming together to create this feeling. So it's as if you could reach out and touch that photo. So I talked about it in the grass when we talked about line. When you get multiple elements together, in the case of that grass, it creates a sense of texture. So if I reached out and I touched that photo of the grass, I in my mind's eye, I could say, ooh, it feels spiky. It feels uh, like the synthetic lawn. It feels not sharp like it's going to cut me, but sharp as in a lot of pokey, pokey feelings. So if you feel like you can talk about a photo in terms of if I could reach out and touch it, what would it feel like? That is an indication that it has texture. Texture tends to be some sort of repeating element that is unified across an area or a page. Okay, next up your exercise is to pick three of the seven design elements and shoot an example of that. So if I were to pick texture, for example, maybe I would take a photo of something spiky like the cactus needles, or perhaps I would try to do something really silky and soft like the fur on a winter coat, or maybe it would be uh, the silky texture of some sort of garment as it was laying across a bed or a chair or a, a person draping across a person, the drapery of clothes, that would all be an example of texture. So you could submit one of those. So say, for example, one of my photos was exemplifying texture and it was the draping of a cloth. Maybe for my next one, I would choose line and I would photograph the sun as it shines through the blinds and creates lines against the wall. And maybe my last one is shape and I think about silhouettes. So I go out and I shoot into the sun with my subject standing in front of the sun so that I just get the silhouette and the shape of that subject. Maybe it's a person, maybe it's a dog, maybe it's a chair. All right, so those are just three examples of how you could pick a term and take one image that sort of exemplifies each of those. All right, and here's more examples of texture. So for this image here, if I reached out and touched this, I would imagine maybe I'd get cut. It feels sharp. It feels like broken glass. It is, again, unified elements, multiple elements that are unified across the page, and it has a feeling, a physical feeling. Good composition is only the strongest way of seeing. So that is from Edward Weston, famous for that pepper series, um, also photographed uh, a series of models in a very similar lighting situation, also very famous for that. But this quote is to say that composition is one of the most important things as a photographer. After you understand your camera, you need to understand your composition. So also in talking about uh, different ways to compose an image,
This one here has a strong focal point and is really using depth of field to create that focal point. We have the bottom third of the image creating a sense of gravity or weight. And we have our background elements kind of creating this linear feeling to go upwards. We have lots of silhouette and shape. We have stark contrast at the top of the image and we have more tonal range or value at the bottom of the image. So note that now I'm using all of this vocabulary to just simply describe the image and to talk about what a strong composition might be. This is also what I would call probably a bullseye composition, not quite, but almost a bullseye or central composition, meaning the focal point or the most important part of the image is in the center of the picture plane. This one's just slightly off center, but almost a central composition. Another thing to ask yourself is what path does your eye take throughout the image? So in this one here, you may start here or you might start at the biker. Either way, then your eye probably travels around and follows the railing and the stairs in the sort of spiral element. This is a particular way to compose, uh, which is the golden ratio, and that is within a spiral. If you want to do more research in the golden ratio, it often pops up in a lot of natural elements. It's a very, it's used a lot in classical paintings, sort of Renaissance paintings and tile work, things like that. It pops up quite a lot, but it's a very dynamic way to compose an image with your eye kind of traveling in this spiral direction. Okay, and this here is the rule of thirds. You can't get through any art class without talking about rule of thirds, particularly photography. And that is the idea that it's not always the most dynamic or interesting way to compose an image to just have your subject always in the center. Often it creates more interest if it is slightly off centered or in thirds, and that could be speaking about the subject in terms of where it's placed in the picture plane kind of linearly or maybe it has to do with more of the background often the horizon line will fall at that one third line we saw that a couple of times in this lecture even um, or perhaps more like that car example you're giving two thirds of the picture plane to the hood of the car and then your interest level kind of lies in that top third. So those are all examples of the rule of third. Often it's a very dynamic and interesting way to compose is to not try to create everything very centrally and symmetrically, but to use that sense of rule of thirds as a way to map out your points of interest. Okay, and this one here, if you follow the path of your eye, you probably follow it along this line. So we have these larger figures here, they are lined up in a row and it creates this sort of zigzag. What is that? That is an S curve. So this compositional format is called the S curve. Again, a really dynamic way to create a composition because your eye has to travel throughout that image. This is also created through a sense of implied line. So we have all these individual points of information back to back creating a line. Okay, so we're back to point in line. Okay, visual, visualization is a conscious process of projecting the final photographic image in the mind before taking the first step in actually photographing the subject. So that again is an example of the photographer's eye, is this idea that you are seeing the world in terms of photography and composing the 3D world on that 2D picture plane. We become aware of its potential as an expressive image and we see the final photograph in some way before it is completed. So that act is called visualization. And many famous photographers will talk about visualization. We'll see a video a little later on to describe that more. Considerations. What am I taking a photograph of? Why is the subject matter important? How will I convey my own feelings and how can you 
get your viewer or your audience to kind of share that same feeling. What do I want the photograph to look like? And when is it completed? Okay. All things to think about before you even press that button. Okay, this is an Ansel Adams image. We've talked about Ansel Adams a few times. Another term to talk about when we're talking about composition is gestalt. So gestalt is actually a term from psychology, and you may have heard the term greater than the sum of its parts. That's actually a misquote of gestalt, but what that means is we take in the whole of an image, a scene, a scenario before we think about the individual parts. So when you read this, you probably very clearly read the word gestalt before you thought about, oh, there's a G, but it looks like there's a line through it. There's a grid. There's a rod here. There's some stripes. Uh, this configuration is not actually an A and an L, but it looks like an A and an L. You probably just saw this image and you read that word. That is an example of gestalt. We as humans are very, very smart. We perceive the world around us very quickly. And that is an example of gestalt. Okay, so again, this example, what did you see first? Did you see the individual numbers? Did you try to figure out what the numbers meant? Or did you see a giant X? Figure ground relationship. So I talked about that before in terms of positive and negative space. This is one of those very famous optical illusions where the figure and the ground can flip flop. So if you're looking at the white part as the figure, you see the vase. If you look at the black parts as the figure, you see two faces together. So that's figure and ground is synonymous with positive and negative shape. But it's what is your subject? And then what is it against? What is the background? What is the ground? Okay, here's a photograph by Larry Fink. Try to use that vocabulary to mentally describe this image to yourself. And Leah Friedlander, I do believe we've talked about this image once before. How did this photographer choose to compose the image? What choices were taken? How would you describe this in terms of elements and principles of design? Proximity is another important thing. How close are your elements and what relationship do we conclude based on how close those elements are? So for example, these are all in close proximity. It's very regular, it's very unified. So we see this as a whole versus these the two lines each have proximity to each other, and because there's a space in between, we view these as three different elements. Example of that. Similarity, are you creating an abstract unified image with one shape, or do you have other shapes? Uh, once we see one and others that are just very slightly different, do we kind of project that same shape, image quality to all of the rest? Is there a difference? It's sort of like that Sesame Street. One of these is not like the other. Is that what you're trying to highlight? Or are you taking an image of all similar objects and that then creates this sort of pattern unified image? What are you trying to get at? How are you using that composition to create your vocabulary? Okay, so two things to think about here, this idea of points becoming lines, but this also illustrates implied line. So that was the, the same as those, all of those figures kind of snaking down that stairwell. When we have a series of points that kind of appears to be in a row, we call that an implied line. Our eye will just connect those autonomously. So this is a great example of an S-curve composition and also rule of thirds. This is a great example of a plane, also rule of thirds. Okay. 
Okay, and this again is the idea of implied line or continuous line. Um, even though there are no lines in this image because of that negative space that is created, we then fill in that line. So we call that implied line, meaning there's not actually a line there, but our brains perceive one to be, so it's implied. So more abstract, I think often in abstract photography, we can kind of distill these down to their individual parts. So think about this in terms of our vocabulary, what is happening, what can you see here, how is it composed, which might be easier to start with than a very, very complex image. But you have the choice as a photographer, do you want to abstract and simplify your image? You know the technicals of how to do that, or do you want to keep everything very complex? Do you want it to be a more complicated image with lots of different elements going on? Symmetrical and asymmetrical. So you may have learned this in previous art classes, but symmetrical is a mirror. Things are the same on one side as the other, and asymmetrical is still a sense of balance, but it just means that you're balancing two different elements together. Okay, and this often is taken with a grain of salt in photography because the natural world often isn't mirrored, it isn't perfect, but we can start to describe things in, is it more symmetrical or is it more asymmetrical? So this here is a great example. We have this central focal point or point, and then we have all of these elements kind of mirrored on either side of that implied horizontal middle line there. And this one here, asymmetrical, there's a lot more visual complexity, a lot more visual weight happening on the right side versus the left. Okay, and that is all that I have to tell you. That was a lot. I apologize, that was a little lengthy. But again, composition is the second most important thing to photographers. You need to know how to work your camera and how to take an image. But then after that, it is all about crafting an aesthetic image, composing a beautiful image. And there again are all of the choices that you can make to get your viewer to experience exactly what you want them to you can start to really craft or paint your image.